I'm really excited to be introducing Jo Depois, who I sort of feel like a kindred spirit. Jo and I have had an academic career that probably uh, has a, had a similar path. We um, often have coffee and um, uh, you know, constructive conversations uh, along the way. <laughs> Um, but Jo is a fantastic colleague, love her to bits, as do most people. And as you will get from her talk, she is entirely passionate about inclusion, even though everybody else wants to call it special education, as we have many debates about that. But she's passionate about her work. She is passionate about education. She's a crusader for including people and creating partnerships that actually make a difference. And I, I think her work is fantastic. I am so totally happy to call myself your colleague. I'm looking forward to this evening and I'm looking forward to hearing about you navigating the boundaries of difference, issues that divide and ways to unite, which I think so represents your work in ways that you actually take the divisions and unite us and collaborate with everybody. So Jo, over to you. Thank you, um, Debbie, for that really nice introduction, and thank you to John. It's um, it's an honour and it's a pleasure to be part of this um, Dean series, and um, to all of you that have come out here on this cold night, yet another night where you're all working late to to listen. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think I'd like to say that I understand that there's a whole range of perspectives in the room um, and there's also quite a number of you that know one heck of a lot about education. So I hope that what I'm going to say tonight will not appear to be tritely obvious and things that you've heard before, but hopefully there will be enough of it for some of you um, that's not the whole story, that to make it useful. Um, I intend to be provocative um, and I know that this is a really contentious space and people have really strong and opposing views. Um, and I don't, um, I don't expect you to toe the line. I, I'm prepared for you to argue with me, but I would ask that you think deeply or more deeply than you may have about this particular space. I want to really talk about the kind of enduring divisions that have occurred in special education for teachers with mainstream education for teachers and to address some of the reasons that I think that those divisions are here and, and think about ways that we might navigate those in more productive and collaborative ways. So first of all I'm going to start with um, who I am and how I have come so this is a picture of a photograph that my son took on Qualicum Beach which is just outside where my parents live in British Columbia and just by chance it has a single Canadian maple leaf in the middle which is no longer my identity since I've lived here longer than I ever lived there but it's where I grew up. I um, went straight to university out of high school into science um, faculty and did um, qualified as a psychologist and at the same same time qualified in education as a secondary teacher. So my early work was spent working in secondary schools, in special schools, and also working as a consultant to support teachers and individual students, either in one-to-one -one or in consultancy or through professional development. And I have probably spent about 30 years now in teacher education. And all of that has been focused on students who were finding learning challenging in one way or another. Um, and it hasn't really changed the focus from when I started, which is how can I make a difference? I'm clearly an applied researcher. I really am guided by the theorists. I um, respect them, take my hat off to their work. In fact, and I wish I could write like some of them, but it's not where my work lies. As a scholar and as a professional, my work lies clearly in the applied field, mostly in systems, in schools, and with teachers. And it's about trying to make real differences to the students and the teachers in those, those spaces. So with that, find a button here. So. What's so special about special education? This is um, a wordle that I 
attempted to create by going to journals of special education and looking at the most frequently read articles and seeing what kinds of words that come up. I think the thing that's most prominent about special education is historically, and it continues to be, focused on disabilities. But it constructs difference in terms of deficit. So it's about less, not normal, and normal is constructed in terms of a normal curve, which means it's statistically about being average. And those who are not normal or abnormal are those who don't meet expectations for growth, milestones, whatever that happens to be. It's focused on using individual assessment, and I'll get into a little bit about how that occurs in a minute. Um, and its primary tools are psychometrics, so we've got tools that determine diagnosis and then in turn the diagnosis determines the individualized intensive instruction that's focused on that diagnosis. Um, it draws from different disciplinary traditions to teacher education. It draws primarily from behavioral psychology. And behavioral psychology is about breaking things down into component bits. And then if you can identify where in those subset of skills someone has a deficit, then you can focus your intensive instruction on remediating that deficit, and Bob's your uncle, where you go. That is a quite different paradigm, and it's certainly the paradigm in which I was trained. I was at a university where we had the largest computer in North America, everyone had to take coding. My entire undergraduate education was focused on small bits and building to the whole. The other feature of special education is about the where. The where of special education is always about the special class, the special teacher, the special room. In fact, my early work was often um, conducted in a cupboard or the nurse's room or the, the shelf at the back of the corner of the school. The assumption that embeds that is a segment of the society needs to be separated off from the rest. Historically, that was, you know, mental health institutions where we, we put people, and that still remains. And I'm sure that I can see some of you going, ooh, as I'm um, saying these things. <laughs> the tool, the primary tool that we continue to use to decide the most important question in special ed, which is, what is the problem? That's where we start in special ed. What is the problem or problems and how are we going to remediate or fix it? And the way in which we start is with this little text here called DSM. This is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It is um, a text that um, started off very modestly. It started off at 132 pages in 1952. It started off as an addendum to the world's international World Health um, classification of diseases. It was intended originally as a data tool to help psychiatrists organize these emotional disorders that were part of their everyday work. It has grown into a very hungry monster that dominates mental health in the US, in Canada, in Britain, in Australia. I think it was 132 pages in the first edition. It's now 947 pages. And it costs $250, and if you want to buy the guidelines, they're another 110, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. DSM-4 became a cash cow for APA. And it also became the text for training. And that's a really important fact. The other thing that's changed is that at the very beginning, it was a text that wanted to look at internal or multiple causes, biological, social, psychological. And the text was the person or the individual's reaction to those, how they displayed those in terms of the behavior. It is now a classification base on symptoms. And those symptoms are judged 
by professionals, so based on their professional judgment. And we'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. But more importantly, <laughs> DSM-5 in particular, there is absolutely undisputed evidence that the pharmaceutical industry, and in special interest groups, not only determine the classifications that are in DSM, but they also determine the diagnostic criteria that are used for each of those classifications. Tens of millions of dollars of APA revenue is directly linked to pharmaceutical companies. 69% of the people who revised DSM-5 have had to um, declare that they have been directly involved in receiving funds from the pharmaceutical industry. Now that's either directly through um, preferential funding for research or it's direct all out <coughs> payments. So we have this text which is vastly influenced by pharmaceutical firms and by um, special interest groups. And this text in turn influences what's taught in the training of psychologists and psychiatrists. And they, in turn, influence diagnosis and the lives of children and families who are the subject of that diagnosis. So it has the power, if you like, to determine who's sick, who's ill, who's got a problem, who's got a disorder, and, and who doesn't. Um, I think if that wasn't bad enough, <laughs> in terms of its influence um, versus the rubbery way in which it's constructed. There are a number of disorders, including ADHD, emotional disorder, behavioral disorder, autism spectrum disorder, that are based on behavioral criteria. So they have these behaviors that are specific, but they also have the point at which we declare the behavior is abnormal. And that is very value laden and context specific to different cultures. And so I'm going to give you just a dramatic um, example of how that plays out. So these are the behaviorally defined criteria. And this is some research that Umesh Sharma and I have done with um, some of the doctoral students from Bangladesh. And this is one of the papers that came out really. The teachers in schools in Bangladesh, different cultural context, um, they conceptualize students' inappropriate behaviors as intentional, so they've decided to do this behavior. Unacceptable, deviant, and the most important one of these is unlikely to change. So we're talking about fixed. And that is a characteristic of diagnosis that pervades. It's this notion that you've got this disorder and it's fixed and unlikely to change. So another example that followed on from that was that Bangladesh recently got rid of um, corporal punishment. And because behavior is construed as something that teachers need to beat out of children in order to get them to behave, this paper is about, um, can I really teach without my magic cane? Because they took the canes out of the schools. Similarly, with Joseph Agbenyega in a study in Ghana, this is a picture of uh, a young girl who's forced to stand in the sun in this bend down position, something very unfamiliar to our culture, for hours and hours because she and many others like her talked during the lesson. So I know this is dramatic, but the point is, is that it clearly behavior is decided to be appropriate or inappropriate depending where you are, and it certainly changes from time to time. If we look at diagnostic categories closer to home, we find that that is very true. There are dramatically different prevalence rates within the same country across different groups so in, and in different countries. So in the US, if you want to be in the behavioral disorder category, ADHD, et cetera, you're usually going to be a boy and you're either going to be black or Hispanic. If you're in Australia, you're probably going to be overrepresented if you're indigenous. 
we see differences even within our country from state to state. So Victoria, um, thankfully as part of a project I was involved in in 2007, has got rid of behavior and emotional disorder as a category because of its unreliability and a whole range of other reasons. But New South Wales still has it. So Linda Graham from QUT has shown the increasing number of students that are being um, diagnosed with behavioral disorder and of those, the high proportion of those that are indigenous. So obviously children from diverse backgrounds are disproportionately identified and diagnosed. And since these decisions are largely arbitrary in the sense that they're based on professional judgments of those who are doing the diagnosing, there's likely to be a lot of errors and mistakes in this process. Um, if I had another day, I could talk to you about all of the issues in the psychometric measures that are used to determine um, success or failure in these areas. And the outmoded, outdated models of intelligence that premise some of the tools that have been going since 1920 and are culturally biased and, and ineffective. I won't go there because I'll um, get carried away. So we've got same child with different diagnosis. This happens all the time. And I wouldn't be alone as a psychologist trying to fit a child in neatly to a diagnosis to meet funding or whatever else. Children don't fit neatly into these categories. I, I don't think there is a child that would fit neatly, but they're the ones that exist. So we come up with all kinds of other labels like comorbidity and, and add-ons to explain why they don't fit. At the same time, so we've got this really influential text. We've got kind of rubbery basis for the categories that are influenced by culture. And then on top of that, even if you take children with the same diagnosis and you look at them over time, you see that their trajectories are quite different. There are systematic ways where children um, Whoops, develop. So you, I, I don't know how clear this is, but one of the three main criteria for autism spectrum disorder is communication, social competence, and repetitive um, behaviors. So this just you know, clearly show you, here are some trajectories of these children over time, and they're quite different from one another. And that would apply to every single diagnostic category you have. That's not to say there aren't any individual differences, there are. People have predispositions to behaving in certain ways. But it's the context in which they're displayed, their interests, their families, the environments, including schooling, that play out in important ways in how those genetic predispositions will, will display themselves. So if you think back to someone, you have a, an amazing predisposition to music, and if you sat forced from the age of four to sit at a piano and play all day, you might be a Mozart. But with that same genetic predisposition, if you are locked in a cupboard and you never get to listen to music, and nor do you ever get exposed to an instrument, you might teach yourself to play as an adult and be quite competent. And there are so many variations that are not captured by these crude, blunt diagnostic tools that we use, yet they determine how we think about individuals, the children themselves, how they construct their identities, and how our expectations in school. Teachers lower their expectations based on these diagnoses. So do the students themselves. Um, not to say that they don't have important differences. The other thing is that there is absolutely no good evidence for the existence of a special strategy that works for a diagnosis. There's lots of evidence about good teaching strategies. There's lots of evidence about intensive instruction that actually works, but it's not specific to a diagnosis. Am I hammering now? <laughs> so this is the alternative. Many of my colleagues who are here who are involved in teacher education generally would draw from these theories. Theories that emphasize students' prior knowledge, that emphasize their strengths, the things that they're good at, that see learning as relational, 
and about co-constructing knowledge with teachers or with peers in the classroom who pay attention to the context as being important as the task that they're learning themselves. So here's my word bubble for in inclusion. Um, how am I going, Kate? 18 minutes. Perfect. It's just that I have so much to say, I, I could actually go on for two days. So this, this whole um, theme for this lecture tonight was in, in trying to think about what I was going to talk about. And I waited for John to come to say this. I was going to say it at the beginning. But has arisen out of the fact that in this space, as Debbie alluded to, people use the word inclusion and inclusive education and special education interchangeably. People who are strong advocates in this faculty and in this university and in colleagues that I work with around the world use it to mean most of the kids, most of the time, some of the kids over there. Or they use it to mean actually special practices, special interventions with special research for those kids even though they're calling it inclusive education. I, a part of me smiles, but a part of me just shrivels inside every time I hear inclusive ed or special ed or whatever you want to call it. As if somehow these words weren't important and they didn't have really um, definite imp impacts on students and families and teachers in real worlds, and they do. So that's the whole point of this conversation. Now inclusive education or inclusion is just as bad. It's, it's a word and if you go, this is the International Journal of Inclusive Education, you will get these kinds of words about equity and responsiveness and access. And it's grown out of international social justice movement. So there's some Salamanca and OECD and other major centers that have tried to say that it's consistent with our democratic principles that everyone should have access to education and it should be equitable in terms of its quality. And that's certainly consistent with what the Australian um, national education statement is. So it should be fair to ensure that personal and social circumstances are not obstacles to educational achievement. And when we're talking about this, we've moved away from the special ed notion of disabilities now. We're talking about social economic disadvantage, personal circumstances, gender, ethnicity, anything that would differentiate you or your understandings of difference shouldn't be an obstacle to educational achievement. And inclusive so that all individuals reach a basic minimum standard. So this is clearly on the national website. It clearly was in the Millennium Goals. It's consistent with most of the definitions. However, if we start to look at what is actually occurring in our society, we have to ask the question, are, are espoused, declared democratic values about fair and inclusion actually consistent with what occurs in our education system? Or is there a, a distinct disparity, and particularly in the current social political climate? So there's, at the moment, increased pressure to demonstrate improvement in academic outcomes through national assessment and accountability regimes. And I guess the thing about that is it's kind of saying um, what counts in equity and inclusion, what's important. Chris Forlin, Tim Lorman, Umesh Sharma, and um, Diane Chambers and I did a study that was published at the end of 2013 or 14, I can't remember now, that looked at for the Commonwealth Government through ARASI looked at the experiences um, of students with disabilities in Australia. And because we have a national policy, we articulate that differently across the jurisdictions and across the states. So we find that if we look at what does equity and quality look like in New South Wales or Queensland or Victoria, it's quite different 
even just in the space of disabilities there are kids that are funded not funded kids that are it's okay to have this disabilities but it's not okay to have that and then a whole range of other students who are obviously excluded from the quality of schooling that some of their peers have on the basis of a whole range of other areas so um, even within the accountability regime NAPLAN is rarely modified to allow all students to participate. And then on top of that, because of the competition between schools, kids just don't write the test. They're told to stay home on the day that the NAPLAN's um, being assessed. Or they find reasons for the kids with disabilities not to participate in national testing so their school doesn't look so bad. Alan Luke has forever done work in the space of Indigenous students to show how inequitable schooling is for, for these students. And there are others around the world that have repeated this kind of research across a whole range of populations. This is most recently, it was um, conducted in Wales, Australia, Canada, the UK, Scotland. And the same kinds of experiences come that young people for a range of reasons in a society that declares itself to be democratic are excluded from schooling. And it's what Slee says, and I think he just phrases this so beautifully, he says, it's his concern with those who've been dispersed from education into the shadow lands of schooling. So, my little figure with the person that's left out here. So these are the, cha whoops, these are the challenges. We've got these political and ideological debates that carry on about special versus inclusive ed and about choice and equity. And, and choice and equity is being conceptualized in market terms. So we're really talking about that um, parents, even from different socioeconomic backgrounds, are posited to have a choice about schooling for their children in terms of trying to get quality. Um, this is a, a lovely little example, and I'm sure we'll, we'll move that way if we don't dig our heels in and push back against this. Um, there's also a lot of tension in schools. There are parents who are desperate and anxious to do the right thing by their children, who are caught up in this mess, trying to seek support from teachers and from schools for their children. And there is a lot of, um, differentiation that occurs in a school and it's argued in different ways depending on who's the leader of the school, what system it's in, where it's located. Um, got the academic outcomes and on, on top of that I, I think a lot of the issues around these students who are in schools that present problems for the school they're not necessarily just situated in the schoolroom itself. These issues go way beyond the school in lots of circumstances. There are kids who are on social welfare. They're seeing speech paths. They're seeing psychologists. There are issues that, um, from children who are neglected, abused, from poor circumstances, and all of those compound in this situation. And parents are in the middle trying to find how to weave through and get support and get equity and quality for their, their child's education. So this is the space <laughs> in which I choose to work. Um, on top of all of that, we now have this space where ever since some brilliant researcher and OECD declared that teacher effects were more important in terms of student achievement than classroom effects or school effects, we've decided it's all down to the teacher. So we now also have standards for teachers. And accountability and responsibility for all, for ensuring that everyone comes into your classroom, has the right to have a, a, a good education regardless of the diversity, is up to the teacher. The, in the past, we have attempted to address this by treating teachers like vessels and selling them those best practices against the diagnosis for some of these children. So we've had 
constantly and we continue to have and commercial organizations and special interest groups feed into this sending teachers off to do the, the, the best practice. And there's no evidence to show that this is a good way for professional learning. Teachers are learners too. Context matters. We need to build on the knowledge they already have and the skill sets they have and decide what it is. Let them decide where they want to go and where they they're need to improve. So in this space, I decided I would take all of the things that we knew that were best about teacher professional learning and all of the things that respected people's differences but made a difference in the context. So the, we created um, projects where teachers worked together, they weren't singled out on their own, and um, worked in inquiry. And um, so basically these were the, the principles that they would learn more about their school context, you know, what do we espouse in this school and what's actually happening in practice. They would have opportunities to participate in linked learning. They would design and implement change initiatives based on cycles of action research, on the priorities that they set for themselves, and over time we would measure and see the changes. And whilst um, I said to everyone who worked in the project, don't tell, ask questions. We didn't want to come in as other outsiders giving advice like everything else that occurs in this space, but working with, not on. And I have to acknowledge um, David Huggins at this point because I was really lucky in my first ARC project to have a, a systems partner um, who had vision the same vision as me and who was prepared to ride the bumpy ride in this messy space and work. And he got, um, I think I got the ARC in 2001, but we never actually started work to 2002 because we couldn't get enough schools to come on board with us. But eventually he managed to get these schools to come on board. So in this space is where we worked. The first one we tried to, um, we tried to link we called it LINK, Learning in Networked Communities. Um, we tried to use the index of inclusion as, as a set of principles and ask teachers to look at their context against that. Um, and to look at the students that were excluded uh, and the lowest performing students in, that, in the school. Um, we started with, um, what's your best guess? You know, why this student is doing whatever, behaving, not achieving, not interacting, not handing in homework, not attending school. What's your best guess and how might we test that? And the single most thing that teachers said to us in the first round of the action research was, this student isn't engaged because, and that was followed by the categorical disability that they assumed that the child had. This student is not participating because they've got ADHD. They're not participating because they've got autism spectrum disorder. And in fact, when we started this project, it was all ADHD because things do come in waves. And somehow that affixed the blame firmly and squarely on the student themselves. The other thing that was so evident is that despite the, the espoused values of inclusive education, a lot of what was occurring in the school was very exclusionary. And part of that reason is because teachers were left to deal with the issues in their classrooms on their own. Your problem, you know, and at the end of the year, thank God you'll be able to field kick that child to someone else's class. There wasn't a shared responsibility across those. And even though there were some amazing things that the special ed teachers were doing in their classrooms, no matter how well intentioned, they weren't connected with what was going on back in the science classrooms, in the mathematics classrooms, in the rest of the school. And in other cases, there were some really simple school-wide solutions that could have been adopted across classrooms that would have avoided the whole emphasis on the individual child in the first place. Needless to say, um, each one of these schools worked in different ways. The projects went off in multiple directions, but 
we also front and backed and did not at NAPLAN at this time because we didn't have it, but we looked and were able to demonstrate significant positive changes in teacher knowledge, in their practices, in shared understandings, in efficacy. And as a just absolute stroke of luck, ACER decided that they were going to evaluate professional learning at the time and picked our projects and then just elevated the status of the outcomes that we had. So we got another one. One of the unexpected findings in that first round of projects was that two things were pivotal to um, excluding students from classrooms and engagement. One of those was literacy and the other was behaviour. And if students didn't have literacy competence or behavioural competence, teachers found it really difficult to, to deal with. So the next project, because NAPLAN had just come in, um, we decided to focus on literacy improvement and we looked at the lowest performing students and we took secondary schools because the primary schools were easier work, there was more communication going around and what was posited in the ACR report was Mm, I wonder if this would really work if it was in the just high schools. And I wonder if it would work in the more disadvantaged schools. So we picked the lowest performing schools in the state against NAPLAN results for like schools and we picked um, all secondaries. And we basically did the same thing. And there's nothing that these teachers did that they didn't think up and do themselves. The only thing is that they had to do repeated cycles of action research. They had to use evidence to move forward. And we gave them space and time to work together. And the amazing leaders in this school provided that support, which I wouldn't have had if I hadn't had the support of the system. So I, I, I guess I could say, well, if I didn't have David Huggins and Kathy Gedd and who got leaders who would work to support this, whether or not we would have had these changes. But certainly we were able to demonstrate the same kinds of changes against those, those schools. Not all of the schools were able to make these demonstrated changes against NAPLAN. And you might say, well, why would you use those narrow measures that are unable to capture all the really important changes that some of these students can make that are never going to be captured by an APLAN test? But you have to be at the table. And I guess one of the ways for me of working is to stay at the table. So I still pay my $1,100 every year to APRA so that I can declare myself as a working psychologist to have a voice at that table. And by demonstrating successes for these schools against NAPLAN, it meant that we got to get at the table where the educators in the systems were looking and they had a second look at some of the things that these teachers were doing in their classroom to capture other aspects of quality of schooling and the interesting and different ways in which they collected data besides a standardized test. How they listen to student voices, how they use student work, how they video and uh, recorded their own practices and critically discussed those practices, how they developed protocols for examining work and tested their alignment and assessment of that. I could go on and on. And those practices are practices that anyone who's in teacher education in this room would have used all along and most good teachers would use. They were the same practices that were being used with the rest of the students for these students who apparently had such major problems, they were sitting in the bottom 15% uh, of those classrooms. This project um, is, is another example of needing to be at the table uh, in a more interesting way. It was, um, it was a r same, same model, working with the system, working in network schools, getting teachers to work together, collecting evidence of practice in cycles of research. Our role was simply to support them in thinking of ways of gathering, analyzing, posing questions. This project was originally um, set up as to be a project between special schools and mainstream schools. Now special schools would not be, even though that's where I started, where I would choose to work, but it was an opportunity to see if what are some of the interesting things that are happening in special schools that might work for reverse placement 
that might work to be shared. So we started, but within one year, the DECD changed the project. We had nine schools in the first project, and Numesh Sharma, who's here, was a part of this project. Um, and they decided that we would work in 16 schools. They would all be mainstream schools, and it would be called inclusion support programs, but with a focus on autism spectrum disorder. That in itself is just an amazing paradox, but not one that I would walk away from. I think the thing that this project really illustrated for us was how many different voices are at play in this space and the extent to which whose voice counts not only determines what gets said, it determines what the practice and the intervention looks like, which in turn determines what gets reported. And because most of the students in this space were funded for autism spectrum disorder, some of them weren't, and teachers are really good at including a whole lot of other people who aren't funded anyway. <laughs> but a lot of, um, of the people that were at the point where they had the loud voices were people who were outside the school. So we had lots of psychs who'd been hired by schools to come in and determine what kinds of things get said. And a lot of what gets said, gets said in something called the Individual Education Program, IEP. Well, it then got changed to be called the um, Individual Learning Plan, and now it's going to be called the Personalized Learning Plan. However, basically it's a document that prescribes what is going to be done. And it's typically focused on the individual. It's typically focused on behavioral pro, um, programs. And it's typically focused on the negative. Not the strengths, not the things that this student can do, but typically the problem. So if it's not in the IEP, it's really hard to get on the table, really difficult to get onto the table. Um, Kate De Bruyne was doing her doctorate when this project was running, and as a part of the data that she collected for her work, she worked in one of these schools. And I know this is going to take some time, but it's just such a dramatic example of the kind of thing that we see all the time, which clearly illustrates the difference between these paradigms and the way in which special ed versus inclusive ed constructs individuals. So this comes straight out of the IEP, and with Kate's permission, I'm showing some of her data. So this is Ben, um, who has a diagnosis of ASD, and this is his description of himself. I have the attention span of a South American spider monkey with Alzheimer's. If I was able to stay on task, then I'd be able to moderate how much interaction I was having with people, because I think that I'm just interacting way too much. I'm incredibly slow with complex thought processing. I came to the conclusion if I was able to be more organized, I might be able to pass the year 10 maths test. That's a really astute, self-reflective understanding of himself. This is his classroom teacher and his aide. So his classroom teacher describes him as a lovely boy, but other behaviors. We're already talking about the other behaviors. That they affect how you feel about him because he's disruptive, he's loud, he's in your face, he has a history of being disciplined. So we already know the school's response to this for his school, for his behavior in class and towards other students. The, the, his home life is difficult. Again, as we're talking about, these students don't just come and sit in classrooms. They've got whole other worlds out there that affect their lives in important ways. His aide described how at times he annoyed his peers, saying some days he'd just keep talking and talking and talking and the kids would be banned, come on, stop it now. Like, let's get down and get the work done. So this IEP existing strategies focused on the teacher directing Ben back to focus on his task. And this is how it was articulated. So the first one, the first one just kills me. I could frame this and stick this in my office. Ben should sit at a table by himself, facing away from the class, preferably at a table that's pushed against the back wall to minimize distraction. Note, this is not a punishment, but is support and should be implemented as soon as Ben arrives to class. How many of you would like to be sitting facing the back wall 
and not considered it to be an exclusionary practice. And this is 2013. And the second one is, you, you say to Ben, Ben, you need to put your hand up, or Ben, that's not appropriate. And then you start to put marks on the wall that represent one minute, which Ben will make up during recess or lunchtime. I mean, I can't think of a more punitive approach and a more behavioral approach than this, and this is, is happening all the time, and this is not unusual. It's done in subtle and direct ways, but basically it illustrates the focus on this negative behavior without taking account of the individual. Needless to say, Kate gave him an iPad, um, brainstormed with him ways of reminding, and he decided that beeps were really good for him because it was a machine after all, and he could pay attention to that, not a human being that was doing something negative. And um, she set up a program for him just to monitor his own behavior, and hallelujah, it's not rocket science. Guess what? He did his math and, and got back on track without being identified as such. So <laughs> this is, I, I think I saw that guy actually move. Yes, he did, yay. So this is kind of how I view this space. It's, it's really challenging work. It's really hard being respectful, being a researcher and trying to be really mindful of the research objectives and, and the way that you need to construct research so that you can actually say something at the end, and being flexible and respectful enough to work and that respect the knowledge of the psychologists and the speech pathologists and that the fact that they come from different paradigms and the special ed teachers and at the same time really refuse, absolutely refuse to pathologize children against these disorders and refuse to see deficit as the way of discussing them and constructing their identities. It's about thinking of sensitive approaches that build from their strengths and, and what counts as educational success. Do we all have to learn everything that's in the entire world? And do we all have to be successful at everything? Or can we actually make decisions about what's important for this child to learn in this context at this time and how will we decide and how will we know that we got there when, when we're measuring it? So, these are my, my ways to unite. There's probably about another 10 things that I could yammer on about, but <laughs> I think we're in a really wonderful position at this university. We have unparalleled knowledge resources. We, we know that with neuroimaging and the advances, we can tell the individual differences between people's brains. We can put in interventions and we can see those changes. We can see how people who couldn't recognize individuals' faces now have different parts of their brains that light up. We can see the differences between kindergarten children who didn't know how to read and how they read. There are biological differences that are occurring all the time in science. What would love be without the neurotransmitter dopamine? I mean, there are so many things that reside in this, this university. And I think that we need a university teacher education program that takes advantage of those, that supports teachers to collaborate with other professionals and to take advantage of that shared expertise and think of unique ways that we can move forward. And I acknowledge all the psychologists and all the special ed teachers and everyone else who's gone before me and who continues to work in this space. I don't think anyone who works in this space does intentionally set out to harm children. But I really think it's time to say, Let's move on. Let's find really interesting ways to acknowledge the interrelationship between what is going on internally with the person and the social environmental challenges that they, they are learning in. And to balance this acceptance and valuing of difference, but also include evidence-based practices to demonstrate that what we're doing is actually having an impact on, on student learners. And last but not least, to not lazily use special education and inclusive education without actually thinking about what these terms mean, nor assuming that your understanding of them is the understanding that others might have. And maybe 
if you're in a discussion about this, you might ask which inclusive education or which equity um, before it goes on. Thank you. that you're trying to disrupt and I love their attachments to them and I wonder if there's ways that we can like um, use irony to trouble the classifications and therefore people's attachments and I suppose I'm thinking about things like um, you know, cause I think that there, that there's classifications that like are clearly nice classifications and there's classifications that aren't very nice and, and, and if we always call them inclusive or special if that might start like you know disrupting how we're imagining mm. I, I was going to put up some of the most recent classifications that have just been added to DSM like uh, I can't remember all of them but hoarding disorder um, internet gaming disorder um, premenstrual dysphoria something something disorder I mean they're absolutely getting bizarre but um, yeah and and that's exactly what I started with when I said here's an example of the theorists you know the people that provide the light for the nitty-gritty dirty work that's going on the ground and if I could have thought of that idea I would have said hey yeah that's a really cool way to do it so um, maybe we might have a shared conversation Mary Lou about some of the ways that we might do that I, I don't I'm open to anything but it's just such a tired old dichotomy that we operate in and unfortunately I think because the social political kind of arena is set up to support it and there are so many professionals that are set up to be engaged in it. And even the special education teachers themselves, you're just ripping their roles apart. And, and what are they going to do? So the only way I can see this is just in my normal method of peacekeeper is, look, there's got to be a way we can share our expertise and work forward. But irony would be another feather in my cap. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it seems like it's a very systemic problem that you're talking about. I mean, a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm a psychologist and I've just come from a role, I'm a maternity lady, I've just come from a role in a regional office in the department. And what we're talking about is a whole systemic issue of how do we actually change, as you say, these, these political issues that contribute to that. Essentially, politicians, they, they need to work with data. And, and it's not that they want to necessarily, although that's part of it, but they kind of need to. They need to prove that what they're doing and the directions that they're going have an outcome, as you say, some evidence-based factors to it. So the only way to do that is to have some categories that they can fit kids into in a way. I mean, I'd like to see another way of doing it, but it, that's sort of such an overriding problem that to fight through that seems very challenging. I guess it's just a statement more than a... And I, you know, I, I guess it's step by step, but I mean, I guess that's why I focused on teacher education because that's the space that I'm in. And, and although the teacher education I've worked in is all in-service practicing teachers, it's the reason I put NAPLAN at either end of that so that they might come and have a look inside. But it is hard, it is challenging, and it's not something that's going to be easily changed. And, and every time I think that we're moving forward, we go two steps back. I put on the discussion board of our our subject um, last week because of issues around this whole diagnosis from parents' points of view, which are reasonable perspectives. We have to engage with that, as you say, in this, this space. But we put up the question, so what's the purpose of diagnosis? Who does it serve and when? And my God, <laughs> the discussion board just lit up like a Christmas tree um, with really strong um, views that are emotional because of the experiences of parents with children and teachers with children and they all seem to be saying across them 
I was isolated in this, in this challenge that I had. It wasn't a shared event. There weren't people around me to support me in this. And, and diagnosis provided a shelter. It, it drew attention to my child or it allowed me to get out from under the, well, it's your fault, you're the parent. Or it's your fault, you're the teacher, you don't know how to manage your classroom. Have, if we had the label, we're still able to work within, out of that box. So yeah, that's there, but that doesn't direct what we're doing. It, 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 mm, I'm not sure about that. I think that there are individual differences, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't use those. I think we have way more sophisticated ways of demonstrating those. But what, what do we need that for? What we need it for is to determine the kind of teaching response that we're going to have. And I think that we can do that as teachers in our classroom. I think teachers do that all the time. So maybe they need to talk to somebody like a psychologist or a neuropsych or someone else to understand a range of individual differences that aren't within their repertoire. But when it comes down to it, it really comes down to paying attention to how that student interacts with your teaching at that time in that place. And the rest of it's all nonsense. Because there, you could line up a thousand people in this room, and in fact that's what I did for my doctorate. I took a hundred girls, a hundred boys, all in the same developmental age group, all who scored at 99.99, and attempted to show how the ways in which they differed had nothing to do with the rudimentary intelligence test. And those were the ways, when we tracked them over 10 years, that made a difference to their, whether they finished school, what they took, how they saw themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And you couldn't have got a more similar group if you tried. So, it's down to what we do, I think. Okay, yeah. Last question. How much of um, the child's attachment to these categories is to do with funding? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Stakeholders' mm -hmm. attachment to these is to do with funding, is that right? So how much of the, the stakeholders' attachment is to do with funding? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know, teachers as well as schools as well as families are negotiating that space and they change their actions to suit what's around. They're, I mean, if you're from a parent's point of view, why wouldn't you want extra funding? It's assumed that the extra funding is going to actually result in better support. That's not always the case. But as we found in the DCD project, I mean, there were there were individual inclusive support teachers who used individual funding in um, agglomerated ways <laughs> to suit the kinds of things they wanted to do in the school. So in one school, they hired a whole lot of autism coaches. In another school, they used it for technology. And then there were schools that just allowed the parents to make decisions about how that money was allocated. And you know, the UK is doing a mess of trying to leave it in the hands of the parents as well. So, you know, it's not an easy solution, but it's again, because it's, it's the sorting hat thing. You know, who gets the yellow hats and who gets the red hats, and then we'll decide who gets funded, who counts, and for what. If we took all of that and invested it into our school system and into our teachers and the outcomes for all the students, I think we could do a better job than what we're doing right now. I have to stay positive. <laughs>